Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Karibuni sana. Uh, well, my name is Emerald Midega, your session host for today. Um, this is a uh, part of our April CLE series 2021. It is the Effective Mediator Masterclass on Abuse with our facilitator for the day, Mediator Patricia Okech. And uh, we're so grateful to have her, Karibuni Sana, to kickstart the session for today. Uh, we'll begin with the national anthem, which will be up on your screen. It is currently up on your screen. Uh, we shall begin with the first stanza in Kiswahili, and uh, I will I will lead you through it. E mungu nguvu yetu, ilete baraka kwetu, haki iwe ngao na mlinzi, na tukai na undugu, amani na uhuru, raha tupate na ustawi. Thank you so much for, for joining us again. As mentioned, uh, we'll be having our mediator, uh, mediator Patricia Okech, taking us through abuse and uh, how it relates to mediation. Um, uh, just a little bit about our facilitator for the day. Uh, mediator Patricia is a member of the Counseling uh, and Psychology Association. She is a counseling psychologist for the last, she has been a counseling psychologist for the last 12 years. Uh, she's a certified professional mediator, has been for the last uh, four years. She's also a quarter next mediator and a trained uh, grief recovery specialist. So as you can see, we are about to uh, benefit from a wealth and uh, a lot of background and a lot of knowledge. Uh, for now, um, just to set pace for the session, as the facilitator walks us through her presentation and the, and the lecture, uh, kindly take notes. Uh, you can also put your questions on the chat. Uh, we, we will revert back to them uh, in the course. Uh, there will be a section for a question and answer. We can then revert back to your comments at that point. Um, so sit back, relax. There will be an opportunity to address all your concerns. And then uh, if there's, God forbid, any sort of uh, interruption, uh, just, and the, unfortunately you're logged off, just uh, sit back, relax, log in again, and then you will be logged back in and we can uh, proceed with the, with the proceedings. And with that, uh, uh, without further ado, we'd like to uh, introduce, welcome our facilitator for the day, Mediator Patricia. Karibu sana, Mediator Patricia, you're well? Okay. Karibu sana. <laughs> Asante. Yes, I'm well. I'm also glad to be here today. Um, and and uh, I hope that all who are here will learn something from us. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Karibu sana. We're also very, very extremely glad to have you here and eager to learn. And, uh, and with that, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. So today, today we, the masterclass is on abuse and, um, oh my, <laughs> there you are. Okay, the general definition is any action that intentionally harms or injures another person or wrongful use or maltreatment of another. That, that is quite the general um, uh, definition. Um, abuse also is, if we look at it from um, the mediation and the counseling view, it's when somebody hurts another one purposely, which happens oftenly. But what abuse really is, is control. It means control. So when an abuser is there, they actually control the person that they are abusing. There are many different types of um, abuse. I'll, I'll run through them uh, before we, we listen to what we have today. Um, there's a the physical abuse, which is intentional bodily injury. And some of the examples we find are slapping, pinching, choking, kicking, 
Um, then we have the sexual abuse, which is uh, non-consensual sex, sexual contact. And this includes somebody touching another in, when it's unwanted, there's rape, there's sodomy, um, that, that is sexual abuse. There's mental mistreatment or emotional abuse, sometimes called psychological abuse. And it's a deliberate causing mental or emotional pain. And examples may include intimidation, coercion, harassment, um, anything that would cause uh, mental uh, pain to one. Then we have the exploitation. Exploitation, it occurs when a vulnerable adult or his, um, her resources or income are illegally or improperly used for another person's profit or gain. Um, examples that we may have is if somebody uses their elderly father's um, uh, checkbook to withdraw money, to use it illegally without their permission. So when, when that happens, that is also abuse. Then we have neglect. And um, neglect occurs when a person either through his or her own action or inaction deprives a vulnerable adult of the care necessary to maintain the vulnerable adult. Uh, sometimes this can also be called elderly abuse. So when you neglect an elderly person and do not give them what they need, then it is an abuse. Um, Self-neglect. Sometimes we neglect ourselves and that is also an abuse. It occurs when a vulnerable adult fails to provide adequately for themselves and jeopardizes uh, his or her well-being. Examples include a vulnerable adult living in a hazardous and uh, unsafe area, or one who simply does not take care of themselves in terms of food, good clean water, that is self-neglect. Then there is abandonment. Abandonment occurs when a vulnerable adult is left without the ability to obtain necessary food, clothing, shelter, or health care. Examples include deserting a vulnerable adult in a public place or leaving a vulnerable adult at home without um, the means of getting basic life necessities. Again, that comes in as elderly abuse. Uh, uh, the most common type of abuse is domestic. And um, because abuse is a very large uh, subject that includes, like I'm talking about the elderly, then there's the children, then there, there are very many different uh, types of abuse. So today I picked mainly on domestic or intimate abuse. And um, that does not mean that if you have a question later, you may not ask on the others. So in Kenya, um, domestic abuse constitutes of, uh, it, it talks about harmful behavior against a family member or partner, including rape uh, or physical abuse. And, and also in Kenya, we find that uh, statistics tell us that 45% of women and girls between the ages of 15 to 49 have experienced physical violence and 14% of these have experienced sexual violence. So there are many cases that also are not reported. So you can see that that means that um, we, are, uh, we are vulnerable as people. It does not mean that men are not involved in domestic science or uh, domestic violence or are not injured, but women are more injured and are, are more abused than um, any other gender. How do we know if somebody is being abused? It is possible to recognize this if uh, a friend or a family member or a colleague are being abused. It is quite possible. You will see some of them are afraid or anxious to please their partner. 
when, when a partner is, is anywhere with them, they want to serve them, they want to go out of their way, you know, they're falling over everything to just make sure that that partner is, is happy. They go along with everything their partner says. So if the partner says, um, maybe we are going to buy green curtains, even if she didn't like the green curtains, she would go along. But later on, you know, you could hear her complain or talk about the fact that um, uh, she wasn't happy with that color, but she'll go along with it. Um, she'll check with her partner to report where they are and what they are doing. You know, I'm, I'm visiting my mother. I'll be here for the next two hours. Sorry, I'm late. I will not be able to come in good time. So you, you always find that that is happening to uh, an abused person. And they receive frequent harassing phone calls from their partner uh, when they are visiting a friend. So who, which friend are you visiting? Who else are you with? I know very well you're with, your, with, with other boys. You are with another man or something. What are you dressed in? So there are all those things that would be a warning sign. If there's a friend or a family member and you see those, then you need to, to um, think about it and see how you can uh, help. They talk about their partner's temper, jealousy, and possessiveness. Uh, sometimes people will tell you how, hey, so-and-so is really gets angry even when I just walk in the door, even when there's a paper on the floor. And if he sees me with somebody else, he, he, he wants to know who this is and he gets very jealous. Those are signs of abuse. Uh, specific signs of physical abuse. So if somebody is being physically abused, um, they will likely have frequent bruises or physical injuries, and they will have a weak or inconsistent explanation uh, to, to what is happening to them. Some signs that one should look for are bruises, black eyes, sometimes rope marks, depending on, on how uh, serious the abuse is broken bones, open wounds, and treated injuries in various stages of healing. Um, there are broken eyeglasses or frames. Then there's sudden change of behavior. And it is common for victims in this situation to try to cover up the physical signs with clothing. And sometimes when they go to hospital, they will not say exactly what has happened to them. They will have a lie to, to cover it up. Uh, emotional signs of abuse, agitation, anxiety, change of sleep habits, developing drug or alcohol uh, problems, extremely apologetic or meek, loss of interest in daily activities, low self-esteem, nervousness around certain people, symptoms of depression. Uh, symptoms of depression sometimes are like somebody withdraws, somebody wants to stay alone, uh, one pers a person who has been very um, outgoing. So those, those are some of the symptoms of depression. And then uh, talking about um, attempting suicide, that's another sign of emotional abuse. And these symptoms could be due to any other condition, but most of the time we are told that they are typically uh, related to domestic abuse. So when, when, when one sees these, then the first thing we need to do is to find out if there's any abuse before we look at any other conditions. Uh, specific signs of domestic abuse. Um, most of the time that people become reserved and distant. They, they, they isolate themselves by cutting off contacts with friends and family and members. So they, they may have been calling you, you may have been going out for lunch often, they start isolating, they don't do that anymore. 
And then they cancel appointments or meetings with uh, you at the last minute. So uh, they, they, they drop out of activities they would usually enjoy. Just like I've talked, maybe lunch or, or going to a movie or something, and then you find they've dropped out. Exhibit uh, excessive privacy concerning their personal life or the person with whom they, they are in relationship and often late to work or other appointments. Uh, with that, we also need to know the signs of an abusive person. Um, an abusive person, although domestic violence may manifest in numerous ways, abusers often exhibit common behaviors that can be identified by us or by anybody. There's jealousy, there's degrading, blaming, threatening, and um, stalking and controlling, manipulating. So when, when, when you see those, then you know that somebody is being abused. Abuse has got a circle that um, goes, goes within that abuse. So you start off with abuse. You are, the abusive partner lashes out with ag uh, aggressive, aggressively and belittling um, or violent, some violent behavior. And with this treatment, they, they, they want to show who is the boss. And then we go to guilt. It moves on to guilt. The circle goes to, to guilt. And, and the partner feels guilty after abusing uh, the, their partner or whoever it is, but not because of their action. They are more worried about the possibility of other people knowing what's happening, maybe their family members or friends knowing. So they are afraid of facing the consequences of uh, the abuse. And maybe they feel their wife might even report them to the authorities. Then there are the excuses. The excuses usually are uh, the abuser rationalizes and um, uh, the person starts saying, you know, you provoked me, you, you, didn't, you didn't bring my food in good time, or you didn't cook this in the right way. So they avoid taking the responsibility of, uh, of the abuse. And they, they, they then push it off to the other person who, um, who, who they are abusing. Then they come back. Once they have abused and they have given the excuse, they come back to normal behavior where um, they regain control of their power and they ensure that uh, you are still staying in the relationship. This, this, this is the place where they will also, um, it's called the peaceful honeymoon time. So they are back to that peaceful honeymoon phase and um, this gives hope to the abuser. The abuser then feels, oh, it is true. Maybe it was because of something I did and now he has, uh, he has gone back to being the person he is. So it, it, um, it's a time that the abuser feels that the person has changed, that they are, they are, the victim feels the abuser has changed. Then there is, um, that's, that's the normal behavior now. You know, you're, you're, you're back to normal, you're back to doing things as you should. Then there's the fantasy stage. And this fantasy stage is also the planning stage for, um, for, for the abuser. He begins to, the, the abuser begins to fantasize how they will repeat the, the, the abuse uh, they spend a lot of time thinking about what you've done wrong and how they'll make you pay for it. Then they form a plan. Now, one of the plans sometimes is, you know, you've been told ah, you're moving with somebody, you know, this is your boyfriend, and then you're sent to a shop and they send you at a time when it is very busy 
And they know that if you go there, you won't take your half an hour and you're told you must take half an hour. So when you take like 45 minutes and you say, oh, I'm late, or if you are driving, I'm in the traffic, that alone will, will make him wait and the abuse begins. Sometimes like I used to hear my, um, some elderly friends of mine say, even the way you have placed a cloth on the table, that day he will come in because he has already planned and he'll ask, why did you put this here? I've always told you not to do that. So there is, there is a, a lot of planning and then he goes back now. He has set up and is ready for the abuse and the abuse comes back again. So the circle will always go around. The, the abuser abuses, he's guilty, he gives excuses, he goes back to normal, there's the fantasy, there's the setup, and there's the actual abuse. Um, that sets us up to why do the victims then stay? Because they, 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 they still keep staying in this situation. So um, one of the reasons that they stay is because they feel that if they leave, it is very dangerous. It is dangerous because the abusive partner may follow them. That's the feeling they will have. The abuser may have threatened to kill them. So they're in this place and they're just wondering, um, how do I move? If I move, I'll be killed. If I, if I stay, uh, I'm being abused. So they, they'd rather stay in this place, but be alive. Then there is the kids. The kids are going to school. How will I pay? How will I feed them? If I stay with them alone, I'll have a problem. So then the victim does not move away. Um, then there is um, isolation. Uh, a victim feels that if I, if I leave, my friends and family may not support me. My friends will be against me, you know? I, I will not be able to, um, I, I'll not be able to live the same life as I've lived when I'm here. So they don't want to be isolated, they cannot leave. Then there is a circle of violence and hope for change. We've seen that circle, it goes round and round. So every time, the abuse has gone, there's that hope and you think, oh yes, I'm going to be fine now that he has changed. So that circle also makes us, uh, makes victims stay. Then there's the lack of resources. Sometimes um, one would find that the resources they have, they can't live in the same place, they can't do the same things they've always done. So they'll be thinking, why should I leave and, and uh, leave all the, these resources? Then there is institutional responses. And the one that is quite um, notorious, should I say that, is the church. Uh, the religious people, the clergy, their goal is to save a marriage. Their goal is not to stop the violence. So you go to your pastor and he tells you, no, 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 no. This thing is, will work out, let us pray. So that also keeps the, the victims uh, in, their, in their abusive relationships. Then there's the police officers. Even if we reported, even if I went to the police, they will do nothing. So I'd rather stay here because nobody will protect me. And, um, People put restraining orders, but even those retraining, restraining orders, then who helps? It's the same police. So you don't have hope of uh, getting help and therefore one keeps, uh, remains in that place always. Um, there is um, waiting to be a savior to the abuser. Because of that circle, the victim feels, I will be able to save this person. I'll be able to save this person. And they'll stay there hoping that they can be the savior. Then there's the distorted thoughts. I believe I deserved it. 
Uh, so living an abusive situation requires help from the outside. People cannot do that on their own. We have myths. <clears throat> we, we, we have myths um, about domestic violence and we have seen that domestic violence is there. So even with the myths, we need to have in the back of our minds that 40% of women are abused. So one of the myths is an occasional slap or a shove isn't serious. So small acts of aggression can easily turn into larger ones. So that is a myth. Then we have another myth, alcohol and drugs cause domestic violence. And yet it is not alcohol and, and um, drugs. Uh, there are many people who take alcohol and drugs and they don't have, they are not not abusers. So the problem is usually not the victim, but the abuser. And victims bring it to themselves. That's a myth also. But we, we can't say that there is a particular uh, personality or a particular race or a particular gender that has problems of abuse. So victims cannot bring it to themselves. Then we have victims choose to stay. And we have seen that they don't choose to stay. So that is a myth because uh, many victims are desperate to leave, but they do not know how and they don't have the resources. Then we need to look at the interventions that are there for, uh, and these are interventions that anybody and help that anybody can give. It's not necessarily for a professional because this is like the first line of intervention. And the first line is usually a friend, a relative, a neighbor, somebody who knows the, the victim. So one thing is to make time, make time for this person. So if you decide to reach out to an abuse victim, do so during a time of calm. Getting involved when tempers are flaring can put you in danger. Also make sure to set aside plenty of time in case the victim decides to open up. If the person decides to disclose years of pent up fear and frustrations, you will not want to end the conversation because you have another commitment. So create time, a calm time and a time you can talk with the person. And you can start the conversation, you know? I'm worried about you because I've noticed, I'm concerned about your safety. Uh, as, as the person who wants to give help, you are able to start, start that conversation. And maybe you've seen the person wearing clothing to cover their bruises. Uh, you, you, can, you can bring it to their notice that, oh, this, this is happening. But it's also a way to show you that this person needs help and confidentiality. The person has to know that when you're working with them, it is just you and them, and there'll be nobody else involved unless they want to involve somebody else. Uh, our role here is to listen without judgment. If a person does decide, decide to talk, listen to the story without being judgmental or offering any advice, or suggesting solutions. Chances are if you actively listen, the person will tell you exactly what they need. Just give the person the full opportunity to talk. And, and usually you can ask questions to qual clarify, but um, be careful as you ask those questions that they are not questions that would make the person feel that you're judging them. And remember to learn the signs, uh, the signs that we have seen in the previous slides, because with those signs, then you are able to um, help these people. There's professional intervention. Uh, for abused people, the best intervention is an interdisciplinary approach, where if they approach a counselor, 
then the counselor should work with the agencies in the community or like uh, the police, the social workers, so that it's a whole team working together. Good counseling uh, help means that the counselor should become knowledgeable about the domestic violence service in their area. So when, when the victim approaches, the counselor should know the hotlines. If there's a place where there's a shelter, uh, which is not common in our nation, but if there's a place, there's a shelter, uh, we can direct them there. Uh, are there advocates and ad organizations that would advocate for them? Is there a support group? So the counselor needs to have that so that they can help the, the, um, the abused person. The counselor too will not come into the situation and try to help when there's still a lot of anger, like we saw in the previous um, slide where we were looking at help. And um, the counselor needs to know other professionals, like in this case, a counselor needs to know the mediator who can come in and mediate. They need to know uh, law enforcers. They need to know social workers. This has to be something that is handy. And we need to remember that the safety of the victim is paramount. So before any professional counseling, before any professional help, we need to know how are we going to support this victim? How is the victim going to be safe away from the abuser. Uh, before, before going into any help, we need to also find out if they've reported to, to any authorities and if they are getting help from there. I've talked about a safe house or a safe place because somebody would say, I'd rather go and stay with my sister or I'll go back to my parents or, or something like that. So do they have a safe house or a safe place? Uh, are the children safe? Because if the children are not safe, then she may not want to go. So she needs to come to a place where she will say, yes, the children are also safe. And with this in place, then the counseling can, or the professional intervention can start. And, does uh, domestic abuse and mediation, do they go together? Some abuse cases and um, some uh, are, can, can be mediated. There are abuse cases that can be mediated. So what then happens is um, that the mediator would still have to be ready to protect the clients. As they protect the clients, they need to bring in all the other professionals who will help. So the mediator needs also to have a list of professionals that can help. And this, this is if they are doing um, uh, not, not the court referred uh, cases, but cases that they are doing as private or at uh, mediation centers. Then they need to have this listed. Um, the mediator must be aware of the myths and focus on the issue at hand. Um, as mediators and as, um, as human beings, since we already have those myths, we know that um, we, 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 know, we, we, we know that it will interfere with us. So we need to be aware of those myths. We need to be aware that these myths are there and they can interfere with whatever we are doing. I also needed to mention that um, one, of, one of the myths that is there and that interferes with us is the fact that there is a belief that uh, women must be abused. There are cultures that believe that. So if you come from a culture that women must be abused, then that would interfere with, um, with, with, with the mediation or with the counseling.
Uh, some obvious things to notice is how your clients walk into the mediation room. How did they come in? How, how did um, uh, the, the, the parties walk in? Are, are they walking in freely? Notice how they are sitting, notice what they are doing, how they are holding things, how they are talking. The, this, this will help uh, if a mediation has to go on. No, notice the sitting position. So, so, some of them will want to sit very close and that will be a very good uh, mediation. Uh, maybe I give an example there of uh, a couple who thinks they should divorce, but when they come in, it's like they're holding hands. So you already notice that they are sitting together and they are at that place, that point of uh, already talking. That, that is a domestic abuse case that can be mediated because they have already started talking before. Um, the tone of voice as they talk to mediator and to one another, and even to, to, their, uh, to, to their lawyers. How are they talking? Is there, is, is there a voice that you hear that, um, that, that is not, is harsh or is, um, is not calm regarding that situation? Emerald, do I go on? I think so. Okay. Let me go so on. You, yeah? can, you can proceed. Okay, thank you. Okay, for us to know um, if a case can be mediated, we need to have it screened. And screening is a process by which a case will be examined to assess whether or not they are suitable for mediation. Any case needs to be screened. And screening is done by the court. When cases go to the court, um, the magistrate and the judge will decide if that case can be mediated and they'll forward it to the mediation, um, to the med for mediation. Then there is um, mediation service centers. There are various ones and each one of them would do a screening. Then we have the private mediation. That is if, uh, if a client comes to you directly without going through any of these other places, one needs to do a screening. Now, um, sometimes I need to point out that sometimes the screening at the court is not as detailed as the screening of the mediation service centers and the private mediation. I will get into what happens, but we need to have that at the back of our minds that they don't do as much screening as the mediation service centers and the private mediation. Um, so domestic violence screening is to be more detailed than like some of the other cases. And their following can help us. Uh, as, as we go into um, screening, one thing we need to find out is, is the person controlling. You would ask questions like, um, who makes decisions? When you have a decision to make, how do you do it? You need to find out about coercion, intimidation, and fear. So for domestic screening, the mediator is again looking to protect the victim and to determine if the case can go on, regardless of whether the case has been referred from court or whether it is a private one. Why do we protect the, the victim at this time? We protect the victim because, um, be, because they need to write an agreement, they need to discuss with this uh, abuser. So it is really the way we deal with the victim that will help them to move on. Um, 
one would wonder what, how do we get to, to screen? Um, service centers have their screening tools and um, a lawyer who is a mediator should also have a, a, a tool that they can use. But there are different types of tools that people use and that uh, are used for this purpose of um, screening. And some of them can be find, found on the net. So if you don't have one, you can prepare one yourself. And because there are some which are free, you can go into the net and you can find one that will work for you. The mediator has an opportunity to conduct an extensive screening for domestic violence confidentially. Um, why confidentially? Because if the victim and the abuser are in the same room as the screening is being done, then nothing will come out of the victim. So um, the, the, the mediator, if it is a court mediation, then once we will meet for the first time and have your rules and everything, then immediately you would have to go to a caucus. Not the normal thing that happens with any other case, but you would have to go into a caucus uh, so that you can find out whether this person is controlling. And, and most of the time you would start with the victim so that you pick up whatever there is. So you do that separately, remembering confidentiality. And screening is not done once. Screening is continuous. Um, you, you could be going through a session and you find something and then and you need to caucus or you need to go uh, out of what you're doing so that you can find out what is happening. So it is an ongoing thing as, as you are in the mediation. Um, some conditions that help in mediation. One is that the abused party can freely request to participate in mediation and provides informed consent to mediation. Remember that for mediation to work, both parties have to agree that they are going to have mediation. And that helps when the agreement time comes. Then the abused person has um, reviewed and demonstrated an understanding of the materials provided concerning the mediation. Because as they come for mediation, that whatever material there is, both parties should see. Whatever they talk about, the abused person has already agreed that this is how we are going to go. And the abused party has been advised to consult a lawyer and a counselor. If, uh, if it is a case where the abuse is still showing as they come in, then the abused person needs to have a lawyer and a counselor may be of great help as well because then she can move on and make a, a, an informed decision. Uh, I know under, under normal mediation, a lawyer is not a must, but it would be nice for this one to have a lawyer so that they are advised uh, on what they need to do and how they need to do it. So when they come to the table, they, 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 have, they have all the facts. The abused person provides compelling reason to mediate. They have a very good reason. <clears throat> Some of the signs that a case is appropriate for mediation as again is a client can speak for themselves and negotiate for themselves. Remember mediation is a place where parties negotiate for themselves. So if a victim comes in and they can negotiate for themselves, then that is a case that can be mediated. Then clients are able to reach and carry out voluntary agreements. At the end of the mediation, 
there's an agreement they will sign. Are they able to sign it voluntarily? Clients are safe and comfortable during and after mediation. So as they sit in this mediation, you can see that they are comfortable. And there's no power imbalance or domestic abuse, but the lower power party wishes. To. When there's power imbalance and domestic abuse, but the lower power party wishes to mediate. So whether they are being controlled or not, they are ready for that mediation. Then the case can be mediated. And also that the mediator is appropriate for the case. Um, I, I know that sometimes we, we, we as mediators might make a mistake and, um, I, and come into a mediation where we are not very confident. So especially for uh, domestic abuse, the mediator needs to be appropriate for that case. And um, I say that because there's an example that I felt I should give here of a mediation, a man comes in and comes in with, with his wife. And even before they sit, they're fighting. And as a mediator, then what do you do, you know? And, and if you are a bit scared and you don't know what to do, then these people will fight in your office and you will end up being um, part of their abuse, part of their violence. Um, Emerald, I am thinking I, go on. Yes, just, just go on, just conclude. Okay. So, so for mediators, um, uh, one of the most important things that we have been told is confidentiality. So we must for the skill, the most important skill is that confidentiality regarding on what you've heard from the victim or the abuser, confidentiality is most important. So when you're in a caucus, um, you keep what you have learned in the caucus, in the caucus. And then active listening. You listen to every word, you listen to every nonverbal communication, you listen to everything with your whole body. You listen with your ears, you listen with your eyes. So you're listening in a very active way to see um, any signs that would help you either go on with the mediation or stop the mediation. Then empathy, use words to indicate that you understand what the victim is saying, especially when you're in the caucus and you are screening. Um, so, some words of empathy would be like, that must be very painful. That really hurt you. So they, they know that you are working with them as you're going through that. Um, also be non-judgmental. Sometimes we might be judgmental without knowing, but we should be non-judgmental. Um, so when, 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 when they say their problem, we don't go ahead and say, ah, yes, that was very wrong because you've already judged them as that was very wrong. Do not disclose discussions from the separate meetings, that is confidentiality. And then we observe for any injuries from the places they sit. Because sometimes they will come in with uh, injuries and it is for you as a mediator to see that this is what is happening. Uh, Mediator Patricia, yes. If I could uh, kindly interject, uh, I, I see. Oh, you're already at the conclusion. <laughs> yes, interject. Oh, okay. Uh, this, this. Uh, I was suggesting this would be a very good part for the second phase. Mm. We go for the for the health break, 
because it is very relevant to the next phase of the session. And it has just uh, given us a taste of what is coming up for the second session. So we can uh, have this for the second um, session. Okay. 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 Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mediator Patricia. I have personally learned a lot. Um, this, this, you've given us a lot to think about, especially in terms of um, uh, domestic abuse interventions that we should be, you know, having in mind <clears throat> as mediators. Uh, types of abuse and, of course, a very interesting bit on screening uh, of uh, cases that need to go for, as, as you're deciding which case needs to go for mediation or whether it is even um, supposed to be going for mediation. Uh, so right about now, we, are, we actually, I'm actually looking forward to the next phase of the session where we will now be now delving into the relevance of this information that all this information that you've given us and and seeing how it ties into mediation what are the skills that we need for as mediators to be able to um uh, maneuver the you know a mediation in such a case um just before we have about five minutes to go to our our health break uh, i would kindly request if uh, our convener would have uh, something to say before we go for our health break. Okay, um, yeah, thank you. Once again, I say thank you very much to our facilitator for the day, and that is uh, the mediator Patricia Ketch. Uh, colleagues, uh, the masterclass sessions are uh, sessions where we uh, bringing in peers in this work, and uh, we are bringing them in areas that uh, they have mastery in. The areas that they have mastery in are areas that are of value to us. We recognize that mediation is multidisciplinary. When we say that mediation is multidisciplinary, uh, is uh, uh, arising from the fact that it's like you, there is a great opportunity to be able to tap into skills that are coming from different disciplines. And uh, we do find that uh, an area like, uh, like uh, psychological counseling as one of the areas. There are also the broad areas, uh, including human resource engineering, and also at the same time as mediators, we ideally would be also serving such sectors. And so we are delighted, and uh, this is also um, an open call. Uh, if you are a colleague and in your, you're in uh, a field or any, any field, um, from which uh, mediators may be able to benefit from uh, learning or mastery on um, um, that field, we would be delighted. We say, for instance, mediators may be given a, a matter relating to aviation. And uh, it would be great if mediators have uh, some insight on uh, aviation, even if they're not necessarily uh, from the industry. So I thank you, uh, Mediator Patricia Ketch, for that um, uh, very good uh, uh, rundown. And I'm looking forward to the next part, which is focused more on the skills of for mediators. Uh, thank you to our session hosts, um, uh, Emerald Midega, and also to the colleagues who are on the call. And um, we are looking forward to the subsequent, the other masterclasses that will be coming in the other months that are coming, please look out for them. So once again, I say thank you for joining us and uh, we are looking forward to be able to uh, have the next part. So back over to you, um, Mediator Emerald Midega, so that you can take us on the break. Asante. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mediator Wangari. We will now proceed to the 10 minute uh, uh, health break. And then, uh, so see you next for the next part of the session.
Emerald, your mic is not on. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the April CLEE series of 2021. Uh, we are grateful to, for, for your joining us and for you to be here. Uh, as mentioned earlier at the beginning of this meeting, uh, this is the April um, CLEE session, the Effective Mediator <clears throat> Masterclass on Abuse with uh, Mediator Patricia Oketch as our facilitator for the day. Uh, we have already gone through the first session of the masterclass where we have been taken uh, through uh, all things abuse. And now we are proceeding to the second part of uh, the session where we'll be now looking at how it relates to mediation and what are the skills that are required uh, in terms of mediators, relevant skills that we need to be aware of as uh, mediators. Uh, So with that, Mediator Patricia, uh, you can proceed and uh, finish your presentation. Okay, thank yeah, you. And then you can carry on from there. Okay. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, I thought as I was on the break that there is um, a session on the screening that I need to mention just in case somebody wants to know and and that is um on, on on what questions to ask when it comes to control coercion the, the sort of questions that we uh, we ask are how are decisions made i mentioned that in your marriage relationships then you can ask questions like what happens when you speak your mind and express your point of view to the party when you and the other party fight and or ang uh, are angry with each other. Th these, these will be pointers to their behavior, to their anger, to the abuse. And then talk about the worst fight you have had. And, and you let them talk about that uh, worst fight or talk about the recent fight that you have had. And this, this is just to help you screen on how bad it is, how often it is. Has the other party ever prevented you uh, from having contact with family or friends? Or if your children are, are not there or are there, have you been prevented? Has the other party ever denied you access to money or food? Has the other party ever threatened to hurt or kill you? or himself, do you have any concerns about sitting in the same room with the person? So I thought I needed to mention that so that um, at least it is something that when you are also having um, uh, uh, parties, you can use to, to find out as you're screening. I had, I had mentioned about the, the skills which go with that. And I believe that we, we now know the skills that we can use. And, and so as we wait for any questions or the case study, okay. So we can now kindly drop the screen. Mm. Okay, thank you so much for, for that uh, bit of information. We will now proceed to a case study. Uh, then uh, we, I will read out the case study and then mediator Patricia Kokech can be able to take us through some of the highlights, some of the salient issues that uh, arise in uh, a situation like this and how we can be able to handle them. So before you is a case study, a situation that uh, is very likely to appear uh, before any of us as mediators. And so I will read it out. Duncan and Debbie have been married uh, for eight years and with one child who goes to an international school and have a dog which they, owned together, which they owned while they lived together. 
Debbie moved out of their matrimonial home and has filed for divorce. She would like total custody of the child with minimal visitation right for Duncan, as well as child support and pet support. As they come in with their lawyers, you notice that Duncan looks for the father's seat from Debbie, but at a position that he can face her squarely. Even before the session starts, Duncan looks uneasy and mama's under his breath. During the session, Debbie does not have a chance to talk and her lawyer, who, and her lawyer has to take over. Duncan has no patience with his lawyer and curses under his breath. He even attempts to walk out of the mediation room. At this point, the mediator calls for caucus. So, um, Mediator Patricia, that uh, that's it looks like a very real, real uh, experience, real uh, type of issue that can one a mediator can come across. Mm -hmm. And so, I think in this case, what is running through my mind is what are the issues arising? What are the salient issues arising? What are the those, uh, during your presentation, you mentioned something on um, uh, signs and symptoms of uh, signs of abuse, ways that you can recognize that there's abuse going on. And, uh, you know, so just from an informative uh, position, what are these issues that are coming up? And then um, if I could also tie it in with an aspect of your presentation, which was a screening, you mentioned something to do with screening. Uh, uh, so that you can determine whether this matter can go for mediation, whether it is uh, it is something that an issue that can be mediated upon. So in a situation like this, could you tie that in and uh, help us see how as mediators we'd be able to screen a, a situation, a case like this? Mm -hmm. and what okay. Um, well, one of the things that one notices there is the way they are the abuser or the other partner walks in and walks in quickly to sit at a place where he can face the victim. That, 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 that will show you that there is something wrong because under normal circumstances, when they walk into the, uh, the, the, the mediation room, most, of, most people will wait for you to direct them or they will walk and they will sit sort of together in, in, in a way that, um, that, that is easy for them to talk. But when one comes and sits so far and in a, sets themselves in a position that they are going to be actually seeing the victim, that shows you that the person is an abuser and that there's still a bit of uh, friction and conflict among them. Uh, there's the murmuring. The person is murmuring because one, they are within the court and they don't know what would happen. But because they do not even respect their lawyer, they can curse the lawyer. So in that case, again, there is, um, uh, th there, there is a sign that this person has no respect and is quite controlling. Um, when you see how the lady is, um, letting her lawyer now talk. It means that even her, she has fear because most of the time in a mediation, once you've set the pace going, the parties themselves talk, but here she lets her lawyer do the talking for her. So definitely there is something that is amiss and you need to notice that because she can't talk, is it because of the intimidation and um, the standing up, as a mediator, you, you need to tell, okay, you are sitting in that position. So you tell them, you know, you can't stand up like that. But what we shall do is we shall go into a caucus and use the lawyer to stop them so that you go into a caucus with the victim because you can see the person who is intimidated. So once you're in that, then you start finding out how is your decision making? How has your life been? Have you fought? Have you done the other within the caucus? Now, in a case like that, sometimes if it is uh, referred by court, you then need to take it back to court and ask for them to see a counselor or for help. If you're doing it from your own service center, 
then you can tell them what the requirement is because they have come to you. So you can tell them that they will need to sort out their issues in a counseling situation before they can come back to you. Uh, one of the reasons being that when you wear the heart of a counselor and the heart of a mediator, then you can't cancel. You will do the mediation part. So that's why then the referral. I don't know if I'm answering the question, but yeah. <laughs> Um, I like how you've pointed out uh, the element of, of, of the two hats uh, that uh, when you wear, you're wearing the, the, the hat of a counselor and that of a mediator, then in that case, you are the mediator and that you're working as a mediator. That's, that's a, a very interesting uh, point to note. Um, okay, if we now take it uh, on another angle, there was an element where you talked about uh, domestic violence, and uh, you actually said that at that point, your um, your role or your priority as a mediator is to uh, protect the, the the victim or who you perceive to be the the victim in that case. Mm. So, what are these steps? What are these steps? I'm imagining. Okay, they've come in for mediation and uh, you have uh, seen that this person is a victim mm -hmm. and uh, you're thinking of how you can, what are, the, what are the immediate steps that you would take to protect them in that case? Okay. Um, one, of, one of the immediate things, if it is um, a court referred one, is to immediately, because they come, some of them come with their lawyers, is to immediately get the lawyer to get, to help them get restraining orders. And then to refer back to the court so that the court helps. If you are doing it um, privately, then, then you need to know, like I said, you need to know all the other disciplines because immediately after that, uh, I, was, I, I mentioned this couple who came and they wanted to fight. Yeah. The first thing is get them to go to the police. And if they can't, then find out, do you have a safe place? In a caucus, do you have a safe place? Because this is not safe for you. Are you able to find a safe place for tonight as this person cools or for a week or whatever? What can you do? As, um, uh, as the victim, but also not to go on because if you go on with the mediation, then the abuser can go back and um, abuse this victim by telling them that, you know, the mediator was on your side and so now th that is why I'm abusing you, that sort of thing. But the first thing, um, it doesn't happen so much in our nation yet. But I know in some countries, they have shelters, they have uh, support groups ready, they have um, uh, police that will work. And so that is where they would be referred immediately. But being in Kenya, I would use what I've just said, do a caucus quickly and find out, do you have a safe place? Do you have a place you can stay because this is not healthy for you? Do you have a counselor? Can you see somebody who would help you? And then we can proceed from there. As, as you continue, as I hear you, I keep on uh, picking up uh, other areas, other skills, other skills that you're mentioning. Another thing, an interesting uh, point that you've pointed out is that as you're asking whether they have a safe place to be, you're asking in caucus. And I, I think that's uh, also a very important um, uh, element to note because yeah. of the, the sensitive uh, nature of the situation. So that's, that's an interesting um, approach. Uh, now to just throw uh, Spana into the works, mm. we can, um, it would be interesting to see you know, in, in an instance of uh, workplace mediation, you know, how, how, how would this arise? And uh, 
what are the issues that arise in this? What, what is workplace mediation, you know? And uh, how would this arise? And then, you know, what, how does this relate to mediation and also the skills that would be um, required for mediation? Okay. So, Media Emerald is talking about workplace mediation. And this is really for a workplace um, where there can be some conflict, some uh, disagreements. But under normal circumstances, not so much for um, uh, when somebody has been dismissed from work or for their conduct. So it's really conflict in relationship. And in a workplace, the conflict of abuse is usually either discrimination, uh, you can find um, harassment, you can find sexual, you can also find verbal. So uh, th these, are, these are just a few of them, even bullying, for example. These are some of the things that you would find. Uh, it is encouraged for workplace mediation for the people to have a trained mediator, which is not the case all the time. So when a mediator is called from outside, it might be much easier because then the confidentiality is there. If I'm called in, the workers will know, when I tell them there's confidentiality, they'll know. But if it is one of them, if it is the HR, if it is uh, one, one of the people, then they will not imagine that confidentiality is there. So at, at workplace, one of the things that is difficult is the confidentiality, unless it's a mediator from outside. Uh, but you would be looking at bullying, sexual, verbal, even emotional and psychological. Th th those are there. Yeah. And, and again, um, observing is very important and listening, active listening, as, as you deal with, with the two or the three, whoever it is. Hmm. Okay, so I, again, we hear that uh, active listening, observing are uh, critical uh, skills that we need to have. Mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned them in the, the, the family uh, situation, and uh, we are, you've also now mentioned it in the, um, the workplace mediation. How about community mediation? Because now we are looking at, uh, when, you, when you talk about community mediation, it gives the impression of a very large uh, spectrum of uh, uh, issues or uh, disputes that may arise from there. And uh, you know, you're, you're imagining that there may be a, a, huge, a bigger number of uh, disputants involved. Mm. How would this play out? Yeah, how, sorry, how would? How would this play out in terms of uh, mediation? Maybe first of all, just to bring it home, bring it home, because when you talk about community mediation, you know, give us a picture. What, what, what are some of these disputes, you know, ab mm -hmm. uh, abuse that can come from abuse in terms in relation to community mediation, and then uh, the issues that come from there and uh, how you'd handle a, mediator, a mediation like that. And of mm -hmm. course, the that would be relevant in that. Yeah. In fact, it's good you ask about community because that is where mediation started <laughs> all along. So mediation should actually go back to community, but I think we have moved from there. Yet there are still some things that remain in the community. Uh, things that you find in the community um, as general, uh, you, you will find a lot of land cases, a lot of uh, sexual abuse, a lot of child abuse, uh, even domestic abuse is there. Uh, these, these are all in the community uh, and, and um, should be handled from the community level. Um, I, I, I think that what what, what makes it difficult, again, is the belief that the court has everything. Yet within the community, uh, we have the chiefs, we have the elders of the community who should do this work. But because of lack of respect, when this mediation is done, 
by the chief or by the elders, then nobody takes it seriously. Um, there, 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 there is a case, I will just mention it a little so that we understand how difficult it can be. Abuse by the elderly people where they don't want the younger people to talk. So there's a land issue. The older person is calling the younger person names and telling them how small you are, how you can't do anything, how we have fed you all this time, all mm. sorts of things. And then now that means that this younger person has nothing, has nowhere else to go. And they now move on to court. Yet these are things that can be settled within the community. So within the community, you can settle sexual abuse, you can settle um, domestic abuse, you can settle verbal abuse, but we need to sensitize the community that this is going back to them so that they can do it. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. Yes, yes, uh, it does. Um, I think what I was looking for was just, um, you, you've mentioned something very crucial where it's a situation where maybe the older generation, the mature generation are uh, quote unquote harassing the, the younger generation. And, uh, and this is happening before you, you know, how, how I think what I'm looking for are this, the, the skills that the, the, <laughs> the, the, the skills that you would require to handle that situation. <laughs> Because okay. it's happening real time, yeah. Mm. Um, what, what, one, of, one of the skills that you use in such a case, again, mm. again, remember, we caucus. We, 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 we caucus because you have seen the abuse, you have seen uh, the way they are looking at each other, the demeanor, you've seen all that. So you caucus. And in the caucus then, you may not do a screening per se, but because you have used your skill of seeing, of hearing, and, and of just knowing that this is an abusive case, you take them to caucus. Mm -hmm. And in that caucus, you, you can then, you know, in caucus, you tell them, you can easily tell them, you know, we need to tone down or we need to do this. But the skill that you're going to use is still of listening, of seeing what they are doing, how they are talking, how they are sitting, how they are relating to each other. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's uh, that's very elaborate. Um, what I'm hearing from you is that uh, caucus is a. Uh, is 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 a, is a is a great tool for mediators, and it is a it is a highly effective and very necessary in this uh, um, scenario. Another thing, another element that you had introduced, it was uh, during your presentation, was um, the level of awareness in terms of mediators being able to know what are some of the safe areas. You mentioned safe areas and uh, safe areas that you can suggest when you are talking about uh, questioning the, the abused party, whether there's a safe place they, they can go to, mm -hmm. um, the safe areas that you could suggest because they could always say that they don't have a place to go to. So that information, that information where you are aware off the top of your head that um, you can suggest one or two places or also suggest uh, recourse action for them because what if they don't know what to do they're saying they you you have already established that they're not safe but they don't know what to do or what is the next step to take and therefore now the onus is on you as the mediator to guide them through that mm -hmm. you know work us a little bit about that oh okay I, I want to say that in in this country, I haven't come about. I, I, I haven't come across a halfway house um, at all. So I'm not sure if there's any halfway house that would help. But what I know and what I have done uh, previously with one or two of them is that I have referred them. 
to the police to go and report. I have asked them if they have a place they can go to. Um, and of course, as a mediator, I cannot drive them there. I cannot give them money to go there, but ask them if there's a place they can go to and spend the night or spend the week as, as they continue doing what they need to do. Um, the, the police are sometimes not very helpful. So although you report, like I mentioned earlier, you report, but you may not have uh, any action taken. So it is also a difficult place. And that's why you find people uh, staying in this place, in this home, without being able to leave, to go anywhere else. Yeah. Okay. okay. So this, this, this term, halfway house, keeps coming up. <laughs> we, we would like to understand what is this halfway house. <laughs> A halfway house is a house where you go in. Okay, it's like a shelter. Let me call it a shelter. It's a halfway house because it's halfway before you go to the next place. So it's just a shelter, a, a place where you will go and then now move to the other place where you're going. So if, if they are leaving their home, they will leave, go to one place, and then now find their own place to go to. Okay, so yeah. um, so halfway house is is this established, and you you, you began by saying that uh, you haven't come across halfway houses in Kenya. Mm. Now let us bring it back home. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. where you haven't come across halfway houses in Kenya, and mm. uh, the issues are still happening. We still have uh, situations of abuse, mm. and you have someone looking at you asking you, "Okay, what do I do?" You know. And uh, okay, I'm assuming the first question is: Do you have a relative that you can that can accommodate you? But if not, you know, there are cases such as those. So what do you suggest? Oh, okay, I I came across a case almost like that um, at uh, at FIDA one time. I I I did some work with FIDA, and um, uh, this lady says I cannot go back to my house today. And at FIDA, they also don't have a shelter or a half halfway house. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? I, the, the best I could have done was to insist to her that you know, if you know that this man is going to beat you and to kill you, and you have sisters within Nairobi, would you decide who you can go and stay with so that you can stay away from this person? And she kept saying, if I go back tonight, I will be killed, I will be killed. And so she, um, I think eventually, because you can't force, you can't force somebody to do what you think is right. So eventually we just sat down and I told her, you better make a choice. If you know it is not safe for you to go back home, then go to one of your sisters, call them and go there. Uh, and, and she said, let me just walk out and decide. And she didn't come back. So I'm not sure what she did after that. Yeah. But th those are the alternatives that, um, that, that we can give a client. Do you have a friend? Do you have a sister? Do you have this? Is it a place you can go and stay for the time being as you sort out this issue? And, and then, of course, refer them to see a counselor in the meantime and to see a social worker. Yeah. Okay, uh, an interesting perspective. Have you ever uh, experienced a mediation where uh, it is actually the, the man that is being abused in a domestic setting? And uh, what, what are the signs in this case? I, I only suspected, but because I wasn't the one doing the screaming, oh, okay. um, it's, it's almost the same. The man would come in and sit timidly, you know, like scared. Huh? But you see the lady walking in with all the confidence and sitting down. And, and each time I would ask the man what's happening, he would tell me, you know, so-and-so uh, should be the one guiding us, you know. And, and you hear it in his voice, the fear. And you hear... Um, 
you hear the fear, you hear the fact that they, maybe they don't want to talk. But eventually, one time in a, in a caucus, uh, he, he, he says that, you know, why I fear so much is because she doesn't talk. So this was more of an emotional abuse, not, um, not, not physical. She doesn't talk when I walk in, she's walking out. When the children are there, she's in the bedroom and I don't know what to do. And when I speak, she wants to shout at me. And so, yes, uh, that, 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 that has happened, yes, but it is rare. It is very rare. It is very rare. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can I just uh, share the screen again on the case study, which was <laughs> yes. giving us a very good domestic setup. And uh, right off the bat, you see uh, um, elements of uh, sitting away from each other, uh, one is looking down what 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 is happening here what are the issues happening here that the, there is um there is fear there is intimidation there is also controlling which 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 is there maybe sorry can i interject maybe i could read it again for those yes. who hadn't uh, who are not with us at the point at which I was reading it so that uh, they can have a full perspective. Uh, Duncan and Debbie have been married for eight years with one child who goes to an international school and a dog which they own uh, while well, they lived together. Debbie, mo Debbie moved out of uh, their matrimonial home and has filed for the divorce. She would like total custody of the child with very minimal visitation right for Duncan as well as child support and pet support. As they come in with their lawyers, you notice that Duncan looks for the father's seat from Debbie, uh, but at a position that he can face her squarely. Even before the session starts, Duncan looks uneasy and mama's under his breath. During the session, Debbie does not have a chance to talk and her lawyer has to take over. Debbie has no patience with his lawyer. Uh, Duncan, sorry, Duncan has no patience with his lawyer and curses under his breath. He even attempts to walk out of the mediation room. Um, at this point, the mediator calls for caucus. Already you can see uh, what's happening there in terms of one party wanting very minimal uh, visitation right for, for, uh, for the other party. And uh, then of course, there's the element of sitting far away while the other one is unable to uh, speak for themselves. And, um, and so, the lawyer has to take to take over for them. Yeah, what 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 is coming out here? Um, okay. Um, um, I, I I am not sure about the minimal, but maybe there was the reason of the abuse, and that abuse can go to the child, and so therefore you don't want this person to be with your child so often. So that is what I would read from that minimal. Mm -hmm. um, so that it is not an everyday or an every week thing, but it is when it is arranged for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The other question you asked is uh, the way that he's sitting far. Yes, <laughs> yeah, the issues that are, so this is, I, I, I believe this is a very good domestic setting. And uh, mm -hmm. either way, so what, what, what are the elements that are coming out of here in terms of abuse? Just the same way that you broke down for us um, the, the flip side where the, the man is the one that was being abused in the uh, um, domestic setting. So in this one, right, mm -hmm. as we read it, we've just read it, mm -hmm. what, what, assuming that this is a screening, right? Okay. And uh, okay. what can you pick out from that? Okay, uh, what, what, what you pick up is first of all, the way that uh, the lady is timid and the lawyer has to now speak for her because she, she can't even now talk. That, that, that shows that there is something, um, some abuse because of the way they are timid and they are holding on. And then um, again, that she wants to talk and then she stops and lets her lawyer talk. So that also brings a question, why would she do that? There must be a good reason why she doesn't want to talk directly to this man. 
On the man's side, like I had said, he wants to be controlling. So you sit and you're watching this person in a way that would tell them, don't speak. You know, when we grew up, we used to be told our mothers would look at you with an eye and you know, I won't speak. So this man in that position and giving that eye, don't speak. Today, you will suffer or don't speak. So it is that communication that he wants to give. So you know there's some abuse at, from that position that they are sitting and the way that they are communicating with the, with the victim. Okay. Wow. Uh, there's a lot to take in. <laughs> there's, 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 there's quite a lot to take in. Um, so we've learned halfway houses, uh, the value, the value of uh, caucuses, uh, the value of um, um, observation and active uh, listening. But what keeps coming up again, just as we conclude with this uh, phase, what keeps coming up is screening, right? And you captured it uh, on your presentation. You, we, we also tied it in with the case study, but I think I would like a, a summary, a parting shot on, on this area of screening, because at some point you even mentioned uh, that uh, you, you gave us an example and you are saying, you say that you are not part of the screening. So it, meaning it carries some weight, whoever does the screening and decides <clears throat> this matter is uh, uh, viable for, for mediation and we can move forward or that mediation would uh, be a valuable tool for this process whoever undertakes that screening, right, is, is able to um, take in a lot or observe, observe a lot. And whatever, whatever they're able to observe is then valuable information for the mediation process moving forward, mm -hmm. right? So tell us a bit more about this. Okay. I think. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll just start off by saying generally that screening for a case means that you're looking at the details of whether this case can go for mediation and whether it can pass to go through a whole mediation, mediation session. Now, I say that sometimes in the court, we are given cases and even at the first sitting, you see people are folding their shirts ready to, to fight, not only on um, abuse cases, but even in other cases, you find that they have been screened, but not for abuse, not for anger. Um, uh, what, 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 um, what I would say about screening is that it is an important part and that it has to be done well um, we have to find out where these people are mentally and physically. You, what, what, one, one before they, they, because most of those mediations where people are still abusing each other, they don't go through. You can't even sign an agreement. Okay. So I, I think that we, we need to learn how to screen as mediators. We need to, to purpose to be able to do it, even if it is a court referred um, case. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sure I've not answered that question, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you, you have. Um, you, in your presentation, you had said that, that there are tools, that there are available tools to assist with the screening. <clears throat> yeah, so maybe, maybe that would be valuable information yeah, to help us uh, mm. understand how to do it, you know. Okay, okay. So how to go about it, yeah. Okay. What are some of these tools? Where can we access them? Okay. Um, actually, if, if you Google court, uh, it's not court, mediation screening tools, mm -hmm. or uh, how do I screen, you, you will find the, 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 how do I screen for mediation? You okay. will find a number of free tools that you can use. Um, I know um, I know a one or two mediators who have developed their own mm -hmm. and they use it for, for, for that sort of screening. 
for whatever case they want. So um, I don't know if that helps, but it it, is it does. It surely does. It truly really, it truly does it. Um, it's good to know that there, there are tools available there. And also you've mentioned that a very key thing that uh, <clears throat> that you can develop uh, your own. But what is what what remains is that it is a it is a critical tool uh, that that is important and and what it determines the mediation moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, at, towards we are we are drawing to a close of the the session. Uh, anyone with a comment or a question before we conclude? Any comments? Anyone with an experience they would like to share? Mm -hmm. Yes, an experience that you probably had uh, and, and you'd like to share. Okay. With that, we would like to. We are approaching the close of the of the session. We'd like to highly appreciate you, Mediator Patricia. This has been a very extremely extremely informative uh, session, and um, we've learned we've learned a lot. And it's across board, you know, from domestic violence uh, to workplace mediation and instances that it happens in workplace mediation. Uh, community mediation. It was interesting to hear about the the, the elder older generation harassing the younger generation. Workplace mediation and in terms of harassment and even an element of bullying, which I think can even be referred to this other one, the example that you give for the community mediation. And this has part. Yes. Hello. Hello, Florence. Yes, before you, you make your final remarks, can I say something? I was trying to unmute, you know. Uh, that's why I delayed to come in. No problem. Proceed. Yeah, I just want, first of all, to appreciate uh, Patricia for the input and for the fact that she's trying, you know, to tell us as mediators that uh, we need to have our antennas up in a mediation room. Uh, you know, just to be ob very observant and to be listening to what is going on, uh, to be observing some of those power play uh, issues in the mediation, because, you know, some of those reactions are meant to intimidate the other party mm -hmm. so that, uh, you know, they, they don't, you know, kind of express themselves the same, you know, issues, you know, particularly in a family, uh, can easily be dragged into the into the mediation room, uh, where you know always there is that power play. One party feels as more power over the other, and so the intimidation continues even in the mediation room. And therefore, I appreciate you know the fact that she is trying to draw attention to us that uh, we need to observe some of these reactions, some of these uh, behaviors, because they can be telling a lot. They can be telling a lot. I've seen even, you know, um, I've had an experience uh, in a mediation room, actually where uh, the woman is uh, really, you know, um, more difficult because we tend to think, you know, uh, sometimes uh, as women, we are more gentle, we are more, maybe we are always the ones who are being uh, pushed into the wall. But in this case, uh, it was very, very clear, you know, the, the woman wanted to take almost everything to frustrate, you know, the, the, the guy because they had separated, they are fighting over the child and she's forgetting the, uh, the husband has equal right of visitation with the child. She wants the money from the guy, 
but she wants to deny him visitation rights. And, you know, to an extent that she wants, you know, him to, to give her, you know, really a life that is extravagant, kind of to, you know, to siphon every coin. So sometimes all these, you know, things, one needs to be very, you know, um, very alert uh, to, to the fact. Eventually, you know, the guy had to give quite a lot for the sake of, um, you know, let me say peace in quotes, so that each one can be on their own. He had to meet very too much demands, but he decided to put up with it so that uh, they can, you know, be separated. So I want just to thank Patricia, and that was just my little input. I appreciate the sessions. Thank you. Although I had I had uh, network issues, so I was so frustrated. I came in late. By the time I was able to sort out my network, I missed a little bit. Thank you so much, Florence. Thank you for your comments. Um, just to read out some of the comments. Uh, thank you so much, Patricia, for a well, uh, well articulated um, presentation. Uh, and uh, of course, thank you for connecting counseling psychology and skills to mediation, which uh, this is very relevant because now we've learned abuse, but not just learned about abuse, but also related it to the necessary skills, the vital skills that we require uh, to be able to effectively perform our duty as uh, mediators, which is uh, even the title of the masterclass. Um, someone has uh, even suggested uh, for safe house, halfway house, shelter, um, to look up. There's a website there, usikimie.org, and see if they can be of help. That's also valuable information. Uh, kindly take note. <clears throat> this can help. Um, so that's, that's also very interesting to learn that Usikimia, that, that should be valuable to us as Kenyans because initially we thought that we don't have that in Kenya. And uh, again, this was very insightful. And uh, so, I mean, you, you, can, you can see that there's a general appreciation for, for the job that you've done today, for the information that you've given us today. Uh, it's, it's very insightful. And uh, we are now coming to a close um, of the session. I would just love, love to give a very big thank you to the ladies and gentlemen who have joined us today. And for those who have participated uh, through comments, through queries, uh, we appreciate you all. A very big thank you to our facilitator for the day <clears throat> and uh, for the great initiative towards, uh, you, know, um, you know, creating this, uh, information-based presentation. It was very full, very, I can say that we, we have learned a lot. Thank you so much for showing up for us. And then finally, a big thank you to Asiliana Hub and the great initiative towards, um, uh, it's taking towards conflict transformation in our community. And uh, we are grateful, we are grateful for, for the session and for everything that we've learned today. At this juncture, I would uh, request that uh, we conclude that we conclude the the session with the national anthem. I will share the screen, and we can do the first stanza of um, of the national anthem in English. O God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, we're glad to have you here. And thank you so much with that. We have come to a close of the session. Uh, thank you.
Thank you, Emerald, for your well-coordinated uh, sessions. We appreciate you too. Thank you.